One of the major claims made in Plato's Crito is that we should be skeptical of majorities. We see Socrates express skepticism both about the power of the majority, that is, skepticism about the claim that the majority can do us real harm, as well as the opinion of the majority, skepticism about the claim that majority opinion is likely to be true. In this video, we will delve further into Socrates' anti-majoritarian instincts and consider whether this is the appropriate stance for someone who wants to ensure that their beliefs track what is true and that their actions contribute to living a good life. In a certain respect, Socrates' willingness to ignore the majority seems admirable. We admire those who are willing to stick by their convictions even and perhaps especially in the face of enormous opposition. After all, there is no shortage of historical injustices that garnered majority approval and support when they were being committed. On the other hand, this attitude might also be seen as a sign of obstinance. If the majority thinks a certain course of action would be best, and perhaps if the majority has deemed it necessary to enforce that course of action through punishment or social pressure, then shouldn't that at least make us think twice about our original point of view? Can we be so certain that we are right and everyone else is wrong? Wouldn't this be precisely the lack of intellectual humility that Socrates himself accused his peers of having in the Apology? To answer these questions, we need to think more about why Socrates expresses such skepticism and distrust of the majority, a skepticism and distrust which may seem foreign to those of us living in a democratic culture that often extols the principle of majority rule. From statements Socrates makes in many dialogues, we can see that he is committed to a life in which our conduct and beliefs are ruled by reason by a considered judgment of the best reasons for or against some point of view or course of action. This is the basis of what it means to lead an examined life. With this in mind, we need to consider the following question. What is it that accounts for why majorities of people tend to cluster around the same belief or point of view? Is it because each individual has used his or her reason to the best of his or her ability, and consequently, a majority has organically converged on the truth? That is certainly possible, and in fact, this is the idea behind how scientific consensus is supposed to emerge. Ideally, we would like to think that something like this also lies behind processes of democratic deliberation and decision-making. However, majorities can also emerge and crystallize around a certain point of view for other reasons. A majority might form out of some common material interest, resentment or opposition toward a beleaguered minority, or a majority might coalesce around any number of tribal identities, such as social class, cultural similarity, racial identification, or religious affiliation. In Socrates' own case, his perception of how the majority opposing him is formed is somewhat different. What makes Socrates seem so strange to his peers is his philosophical way of life, a way of life that could only seem foreign and alien to someone focused on the typical concerns of a normal ancient Athenian. To describe this broadly, Socrates stands among a small minority of those focused primarily on care for the soul, among a crowd of those much more concerned with the preoccupations of the body, such as pleasure, honor, wealth, reputation, and political power, to name a few. When a group becomes bound together by some shared identity, the commonality that binds the group together can make it quite easy for a given belief, whether that belief is supported by reason or not, to become widely spread and enforced throughout the entire group. The belief itself can actually become a significant part of the group's identity, and this only further entrenches it and makes it difficult for the group to give up that belief even if further facts were to come to light which show the belief to be incorrect. 
When this happens, the fact that a majority of people has consolidated around a particular belief may suggest many things to us about that belief. However, it does not necessarily or maybe even probably suggest that the belief in question is the result of converging upon the truth through reason. Consequently, it would seem that accepting majority opinion at face value would be antithetical to Socrates' commitment of living an examined life. This skepticism toward majority opinion does not just inform Socrates' indifference toward how the majority might perceive his reputation or character. It also informs Socrates' distaste for democracy and the concept of majority rule. If the coalescence of majority opinion need not necessarily signify that the belief in question has a basis in reason, then that would also seem to call into question the claim that political communities are best led by majority opinion. On this point, it is particularly important to recognize how the opinion of the majority can inform and influence the power of the majority. The opinions and beliefs which bind a majority together can quite easily manifest themselves in the form of ignoring, suppressing, or even persecuting the opposing minority. This was an aspect of democracy that troubled the French political theorist Alexis de Tocqueville, who, in his famous work Democracy in America, coined the term tyranny of the majority to describe just this phenomenon. Tocqueville explains this in the following passage. So, what is a majority taken as a collective whole, if not an individual with opinions and quite often interests in opposition to another individual whom we call a minority? Now, if you admit that an all-powerful man can abuse his power against his opponents, why not admit the same thing for a majority? Have men, united together, changed their character? Have they become more patient of obstacles by becoming stronger? For my part, I cannot think so, and I shall never grant to several the power to do anything they like, which I refuse to grant to a single one of my fellows. If we believe that individual people who are stronger and more powerful can abuse other individuals who are weaker, then Tocqueville fails to see why the case should be any different with more and less powerful groups. We could only be assured that this would not happen if we can know that groups of people are not tempted to exploit those who are weaker. In some cases, it can happen that being in the presence of other people can moderate our passions and give us a more compassionate and humane outlook. Yet, group dynamics can also produce a very different effect. Groups that are formed around a passionately held creed or ideological identity can easily fall into demonizing those outside the group, and can take steadfast measures to ensure that their most cherished beliefs remain unquestioned. It is in this context in particular that the possibility of irrational majority opinions being converted into a power capable of abusing and harassing those with minority opinions becomes the most worrisome. As such, Socrates remains skeptical of any appeal to majority opinion, even when it seems like the majority opinion in question favors an action such as escaping from prison which would serve his own personal interests. Ultimately, Socrates' opposition to majoritarian thinking has little to do with whether such thinking is likely to materially harm or benefit him. It has little to do even with whether such thinking will lead to his death. Rather, Socrates' rejection of majoritarianism stems from something deeper, his abiding commitment to pursuing the truth and living an examined life.